titles and descriptions of Christ Jesus. And uh, this is page one. Uh, depending on how it goes, there's two and a half pages of these. And just to understand that, that for me, this is a work in, in progress. I think probably it's going to keep expanding. And so next year, I'll just, I'll just, my own personal thing, I'll just keep adding to the list. But one of the things is if you start reading the Christmas story in the first two chapters of Matthew and the first two chapters of Luke, are you going to go ahead and start? Are you ready? Yeah, it's, it's going. Okay. Uh, is that if you just find names or descriptions or titles of Jesus just in those four chapters, it's amazing how much is there. Particularly if you look at when I say descriptions, what someone else is going to say about him. And we'll, we'll look at it when we get to it, but one of the things is, is when after Elizabeth is pregnant, uh, six months into her pregnancy, it says that Mary goes to visit her, and Mary walks in and, and acknowledges, and in the whole story of, about that studying the culture of how people made themselves aware um, when, so that they knew somebody was there. But anyway, what Elizabeth says is that, you know, when, when I heard you announce yourself, my baby jumped inside of my womb. And then Mary, Mary or Liz goes on to say, Elizabeth goes on to say, uh, how special it is that the mother of my Lord would come to visit me. And she is making a declaration before anybody else does that she knows who this person is that's growing in Mary's womb. This is the Lord. And then the other thing to understand when, when she uses that term, and I mentioned it just a little bit last week, that because of the Babylonian captivity and all the things that happened when they finally got to come back to Jerusalem and, and how they were carried away because of the basic thing that got them into that situation was idolatry. And that's when you read constantly through that Old Testament the warnings of the prophets before that Babylonian captivity happens. It was about the fact that they had started serving the gods of the people that they were supposed to have taken care of all of that and not have been a part of that, and yet they kept coming back to it. And eventually, that's what got them into captivity and carried off in, in, into Babylon. And anyway, after all of that had happened and they got to come back, there became such a respect for the name, what we call Jehovah or Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, that they would not say that name. And if they, if they, were, if they were reading it from the scrolls and, and the scribes were transcribing it, they would come to that and they would say, Lord, because they held the name in such high respect that they wouldn't say the words. In fact, a lot of scholars say that's why we may not know exactly how that name was pronounced because they quit saying it. And, and uh, in fact, one of, one of my scholars or one of my Bible teachers in college would say what they would do is instead of saying Yahweh or Jehovah, they would say Adonai, which would have, would have been the word for Lord. And in fact, they, they took that name so highly that scribes, when they were making new scrolls and making copies, when they would come to that name, they would get a new pen, they would get a new feather, whatever they were writing with, and they would write only that word with that, and then they would destroy it. That's how much they revered that name. And so it became typical to say Lord. And that wasn't the only word for, use for that word, obviously, because it could also mean, like it did in the New Testament, someone who was, was a Lord over something. But when it's talking about Jehovah or Elohim, which is another word for God, which is what is used in Genesis 1.1, they would say, particularly in that YHVH or Jehovah, they would say, Lord. And so when, when Elizabeth makes that confession, the mother of my Lord has come to visit me, that gives us a clue of what that description is supposed to mean. 
And this is, and it, we'll, we'll get into some of the scriptures. Uh, uh, we won't tonight. Yeah, we will too tonight about John, uh, where it talks about the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and, and all of those things. What, how precious and how special those words are. So there is so much in the names, titles, and descriptions. And I think so far I've come up with about 50 or 55 of them from both the Old and New Testament. As, it, as you're working your way through about who this person is, and the key thing to remember is that each one of those names has a significance of what this person, Jesus Christ, came to do and wants to do in every life who will confess him as Lord and Savior, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And so that's what got me into this. So it's just an ongoing thing, and, and we'll see how it goes. And last week I got way too, uh, way too, too much verbiage in what I was doing and kept us a little longer, so try and do a little bit better tonight. But anyway, that's what brought this about, names, titles, and descriptions of Christ Jesus. And by the way, we'll come to that, but Christ means the anointed one or the Messiah, and Jesus is for Jesus, which is for Yahweh. That's a part of what that name means. And so it's the Lord of salvation is literally what his name means. And so we'll look at the scriptures if we get to it. When, when first God revealed to, to Mary and then to Joseph, you will name him Jesus because that's going to describe what his purpose is in being. So We'll just get into that, name, titles, and, and descriptions of, of Christ Jesus. And so we'll pray before we start, and hopefully if you have a prayer request at the end, we'll ha have enough time, and we'll, if we can overcome the smell of what they're cooking downstairs and not want to go eat too badly. That's what I was telling you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they are, they are cooking for what they are going to have Sunday night for the, for the dinner we're going to have. Uh, and then watch the movie. So that's why uh, that that that's why that that's going on down there. So uh, we will pray, and then uh, and uh, try to fast through this and not want to go pig out because that's what I want to do. All right, let's pray, and we'll just ask the Lord to help us to enjoy this time of year. And I'll share a few things to start about some traditions just briefly. But, but anyway, then we'll get into some of these, starting with the Old Testament. Heavenly Father, as we get into the Word, that you will open our hearts to each one of us individually, that there may be a significance in a name here to meet a need that we have personally in our spirit, soul, body, whatever needs to happen that these are descriptions of what Jesus came to do for each individual who will trust in him as Lord and Savior. Reveal that to us, open our hearts to us, our hearts to it, Father, and may we rejoice and really have joy to the world in our own hearts because the Lord has come and he became flesh for us and grace and truth are revealed in everything, Father, that Jesus is. And Lord Jesus, we just make our confession to you. You are Lord. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Uh, you are Emmanuel, God with us. And we just pray our hearts will be opened and blessed as we share together. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that I won't, we won't get into it too deeply but there are some things that I just wanted to share. Uh, and, and last week I shared, if people have a spiritual reason for not wanting to celebrate on December 25th, that's okay. Because we looked at that last, last week from Romans, where Paul says one person uh, celebrates on one day and, and one another. And Paul goes on to say, whether you do or don't, as long as you do it to the Lord, that's all right. But he also doesn't want, con want tension or contention brought into the body of Christ over something uh, like that because what's important is to worship and serve Christ and it's not quite the same as as uh, uh, 
taken over the holiday that people celebrate with candy and witches and warlocks and making it a Christ day because that's really what Christians ought to do if they're comfortable with that, of making that a Jesus day rather than something that honors the darkness. And it's the same thing with, with uh, celebrating or honoring the moon. Uh, you know, a lot of people on the dark side want to take that over, particularly if, like, there's two full moons in a month and all that kind of stuff. They get in all kinds of stuff. Jesus made that. And that is to glorify him. And then Barry McGuire goes on to talk about after he was saved and they were traveling someplace on a bus, the music group, to go have a, have a worship concert back in, the, back in the, the hippie days in the 70s when the Jesus music was, was going. Some guy was, some guy was reading in there about the creation story, and he was getting all excited. And Barry said, well, what are you reading? He said, I'm reading about the creation. And he said, well, what? And he said, well, it's about God created the sun to rule the day and then the moon to rule the night. And he said, you know, we're the moons. And Barry said, well, you know, he said, I'm kind of thick-headed, so what do you mean by that? We're the reflection of the sun because the moon doesn't have its own light. And this guy went on to say, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the reflection of Jesus in the world. Amen. And so that's the thing about, you know, what we celebrate as long as we're doing it unto the Lord. That's what matters. But anyway, I, I just wanted to share uh, just a couple of things quickly. Then we'll get into, get into the scriptures about some of the basic things. And this is not a deep study, but, but just, just to share with you, you about them. How many of you put up a manger scene? Anybody? I've got, I've got one, uh, just a cheap one I bought because the real nice one I had finally fell apart just so I've got Mary and Joseph and the baby lit up in the front yard and then with a cross and an angel uh, and, and that, that, that type of thing. Uh, but anyway, the first major scene was, was, and if you'll probably know the name, was put up by St. Francis of Assisi. Or as my Catholic brother and now gone to be with the Lord cousin on Linda's side of the family, Francis the Sissy. That's what he used to call it. And Phil had studied for a little while to maybe go to the priesthood and decide he couldn't keep the vow of silence, so he gave that up. But at any rate, St. Francis of Assisi, in what one historian says is 1224 A.D., is the first one to actually set up a nativity to honor Jesus. And what he did was set up a lot. He took people and set it up with people and with animals. And anyway, that's what this one historian says happens, and I, I just shared a little bit that when I was a kid growing up, we had Keeping Christ in Christmas at the 4-H building every year in El Dorado in the Four Square Church. We would put up a live nativity set, the Four Square Church would. But it, because we had sheep, and, and so we'd have a lamb or, or a ewe or something there or whatever. But anyways, so there's a real good reason for doing that. Then the Christmas tree. And I don't know if you put up a Christmas tree or not. I, I don't put up a big one anymore. I got a ceramic one. But, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, according to tradition and history, in 70 A.D., St. Boniface, a missionary to Germany, or his ministry was in Germany, where they worshipped trees. Uh, they were out worshipping an oak tree. And anyway, he cut it down, according to, to the story that goes, uh, and it was the center of where this, this group or in that, in that town or, or whatever it was they're worshiping. And history and tradition says that after he cut it down and got rid of it, a fir tree came up basically out of the center of it. Now, that's, what, that's the tradition of it. And so while not worshiping the tree, he, what he said was that represents the evergreen, the everlasting life of Christ that comes, the true one we ought to worship. So anyway, that's uh, represent the eternal Christ. So the Christmas tree is not a bad thing. And then the idea of having a tree in the house comes from Martin Luther in, at about in the 1500, about 1500 A.D. around in, around in that time frame. Uh, and you know the story is about Martin Luther. And by the way, some tradition still has he wrote uh, two of the verses of Away in a Manger, and now they're saying that's probably not true. But at, at any rate, he was a very important person, a follower of Christ, and he was walking at night uh, in the wintertime after some snow, and he saw this glistening of the moonlight on the evergreens, and it just, and it hit him so hard about who Jesus was and what he had done that he cut the tree down and brought it in, and obviously you can't have the snow and the moonlight 
so he put candles on and that's the that's the typical tradition of the christmas tree with with martin luther and that that what he was portraying was jesus is the light of the world so if you do that and remember that that's who it represents then that's a good thing and then of course there's santa claus uh saint nicholas and about about 300 a.d there is a real person and i brought a book that we bought that linda found and bought for michelle that says when she was a little girl says santa are you for real and anyway it gives a real good after it it talks about this conflict this kid is having because kids at school are you know talking about it and there is no santa anyway so he goes to his dad and says you know and so the, it's the dad's explanation, and I won't read it, but anyway, it's a very interesting thing. I'm just going to share some of the facts about it. But there really was a person named St. Nicholas. He was a young man. He was poor when he was, when he was a child. And anyway, he got in, accepted Jesus, and got into ministry and then in, into the, the, the priesthood uh, ministry part of it. But one of the things, he, he, because of how God had blessed him, he had money, and in this town that he was in, there was this couple who had three daughters, and they were becoming all marrying age, but they were too broke, too poor to be able to provide a dowry, and that was typical then. And so according to tradition and history, Nicholas took money, put it in a bag, and snuck up to the house and threw it in a window. Now, some traditions say he put it down the chimney. The only problem with that, if it was a fire was lit, it wouldn't have worked. But, so I, I think it's probably through the window, but, but then what tradition and history says, they had socks hanging by that window that were for drying, and it went into a sock. Well, the, the dad and the mom never knew where it came from. The first daughter got married off. The second one, Nicholas, did the same thing. And then when the third daughter came, he did the same thing. And anyway, the, the, the father heard him and then saw who it was, but anyway, tradition also says they kept it a secret because St. Nicholas didn't want to have anything come to him. He just wanted to help. So the idea of gift giving, of course, the first Christmas is God giving his gift to his son, but that's just some of the traditions that go with Christmas, and they go back quite a ways. And by the way, back to the tree, the tree didn't really become a part of the American thing, and most, most of them that I've read at least say it was because of the German tradition of where it all took place. It finally came with German immigrants to here and then finally became the custom in, in America. But you can, and by the way, you can find a lot of different people say a lot of different things about some of this stuff. But anyway, that's just kind of, of the basic idea. So, and like when I was reading in, in the book, Come and Behold Him, that Jack Hayford, that, that Jack Hayford wrote, uh, and he talks about all the great things that Christmas can be if you make it something that has to do with Christ. And that's what he and his family and his church did, Church on the Way, that went from a hundred to thousands when, during the Jesus movement and all that in, in, uh, in, in Van Nuys, California. But anyway, he talks about that, and I, I don't know if I mentioned last week, but he talked, talked about being in New York, I think I did, when he and his wife were in New York, they'd been there for meetings, it was Christmas time, and they went into some of the real fancy places in New York. And what shocked Jack Hayford was that in these commercial stores in a secular setting, he would hear Christmas carols like Joy to the World, O Little Town of Bethlehem, Silent Night, in a place when, when you would never hear another word about Jesus in those stores. And so that's why he said Christmas, even, it, even if it becomes commercial, can still be used to glorify Christ. But anyway, that's just some of the things about it. So uh, back to some of those traditions. And like I said, you can look them up and find, and I've got a lot of different books and, and stuff, and some of them will be a little different. But it is rooted in the concept of honoring Jesus Christ and the fact that he was born. And like last week in the sheet we gave out about the specific dates and times and all that kind of stuff because the Bible does give a historical record that can be checked. And so we'll get into these names and, and descriptions and, and titles. So we'll go first, since, I, since it started this way, we'll just go to Genesis 3.15. And I'll, I'll just share this verse with you. This is after the fall, after Adam and Eve have bought the farm spiritually. 
And, and, and anyway, God still has a plan for what's going to happen. And so if you go to Genesis chapter 3, and it's in that section where God is talking both the serpent and, and, to the, and, and to Adam and Eve. But anyway, if you go to verse 15, because it's talking about, talking about, the, about because, at verse 14, because you've done this, and he's talking about the serpent, you are cursed, cursed more than all the cattle and beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And it's called the proto-evangelicum. It's the first, and, and that's a big word, proto meaning first, Evangelicum means the message of salvation. The first time it's specifically mentioned in Scripture. And if we think about it, when Jesus dies on the cross, yes, it looked like Satan is one. But Jesus stomped on him because Jesus paying the price even before the resurrection is what sets us free. And that's why Paul always says, the, the, it's like Paul is saying, and Paul mentions a resurrection in all of his epistles and, and Romans and all that over and over, but he constantly says it's the message of the cross. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The message of the cross is to those who are perishing is foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And God started it clear back in Genesis, letting them know that through the seed of woman, this is what's going to transpire. And then Isaiah has so much. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn a little bit to Isaiah. Because Isaiah it has so many things. Um, prophecies about Jesus and it starts very early so we'll just look at some of those and one of the, one of the real important ones and, and it's either Pastor John or Pastor David has done an exceptional study on, on what this means but in 714 and this is quoted again in Matthew when the angel is talking to Joseph uh, but in Matthew uh, 714 I'm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 7, 14 is quoted in Matthew chapter 1, excuse me. Uh, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold the virgin, seed of woman. That's going to be repeated to both Joseph and Mary. The Lord himself will give, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear you a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with God us and that happens a couple of times in scripture where that word is used and you can get into all kinds of things of, of looking up the word and, and all that kind of stuff but anyway Emmanuel God with us and no one probably without the witness of the Holy Spirit had any idea what that meant knowing that God was going to take on human flesh and that Jesus would never cease being God, never cease being the Word, even though in Philippians chapter 2 he is going to empty himself of all those divine prerogatives that he had as being the creative agent of everything that exists, as a couple of the songs we sang tonight in worship talked about. He's never going to cease being God, and he literally will be God with us in human form as John has been teaching us about the gospel of John every place he went every footstep he took it was God with us and we're going to eventually find that and John has talked about it Jesus finally tells people that it will listen to him when you have seen me you have seen the father and then of course John when he talks about it, he's been teaching us, there were times when that's what they 
they were going to take up stones and stone Jesus and kill him because they realized what he was saying that was making him God. And so they wanted to kill him for it. But anyway, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, 9-2, and chapter 9, we'll look at some other really neat things. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And we'll look at it, but in John, the first chapter, that's what it talks about, about the word is light and life. That's who he is. So anyway, that's the, he is a great light. And sometimes we need the light to shine on us to make us realize when we're not, a, not following Jesus or we're not a believer yet, the light needs to shine down inside of us and say, you understand that that's the only option you have to be saved. And so we need that light of revelation for that. After we become a Christian and live for Christ, we need that light to shine in us to show us a lot of times steps we need to take or changes we need to make. And then as Barry McGuire and this other guy were saying, we need the light to shine through us so that other people can know. So he's the great light. And then you go on in that chapter, chapter six, or verse 6 in, in Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born, and we'll look at the Greek words later on about the different words that are used for baby and for child. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So these are some of the names that are going to be given to this Jesus. Now let me just explain. A lot of scholars, and if you have a a new King James Spirit-filled Bible, and if you don't, I rem they're just a fantastic thing. But they bring out what a lot of scholars do, that Wonderful Counselor probably need, is one title in itself, rather than five titles, it's Wonderful Counselor. And that can, you know, if, it, if it's not taught that way, that's fine too. But what, it, what, they, what they mean, and I looked up the, the Strong's Concordance of, of the Hebrew words, the ideal wonderful is marvelous, or miracle, uh, and then counselor is a title of, of one to advise, to counsel, or to show the way. Oh, and is Jesus ever that? We're going to look at John, and one of the things he's going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, and what he is saying is there is no other. There are no other religious answers to coming to God being forgiven and making eternity I am the only way and so anyway those but anyway and then mighty God and that's an interesting thing uh, that he claimed that the Isaiah as he's prophesying says this Jesus will be called mighty God and the word there is not Jehovah but it's a word L used for God or one of the words and mighty means to one who is, is, can mean all-powerful, superior, can do anything and everything. And that's who this Jesus is. And we probably won't have time tonight, but in this book, Behold, Come and Behold Him, Hayford has a, a thing taken from Colossians, the first chapter, which talks about who this Jesus is in his pre-incarnate state and then what he has done and what he did after when he came to us so that we can be delivered from sin and taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light through his death on the cross. But anyway, that whole thing, that, that mighty God, everlasting Father, and that's an interesting term, but remember, that's what Jesus told those people who were listening to him, I am the Father, I and the Father are one. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All of those tendies, and by the way, that word is the word Ab, and in the New Testament in Romans it talks about he will, we call him Abba Father which in the Aramaic was to be called Daddy Father and the reason probably they think that that was made because Father has a tendency to be a kind of a, 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 an uplifted title where Daddy is one that brings it down personal and both apply that he is, the, he is Father and Jesus is a part of that ministry, everlasting Father, because he's the one that brings us into relationship with God through reconciliation. 
and that's in, in Romans, the end of Romans chapter 8 also. Um, but at any rate, or actually in the middle of Romans chapter 8, and then Prince of Peace. And that word, that word is Shalom. And if you know anything about the Jewish culture, and I learned this from the professor that I had at Life Bible College, that the typical greeting for in Jewish culture, and probably still is today, only they may not use the Hebrew Aramaic or anything like that, but it's shalom, peace. And the way they would greet each other, the way Dr. Walken would say it was shalom alakim, peace be unto you. And that word meant everything good and nothing bad be to you as an individual. And that's what I'm proclaiming for you as they would greet each other. And when they left each other, the prince of, and the word prince there is that the one who's above, the one who's the top dog, uh, the top person. So he is the prince of peace and Jesus whole purpose was to bring us into peace with God Romans chapter 5 verse 1 therefore having been justified by faith not through anything we do we've got absolutely nothing to offer to bring us into that relationship of peace except the emptying ourselves and coming by faith to God and saying you've done it all through Jesus I accept that as the total payment. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then not only that, in Philippians, it also says then later on, I think it's in chapter 4, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. And the Greek word is irene. And if you know anybody named Irene, and I have an aunt who's now gone to be with the Lord who was named Irene. That name means peace. Irene. But, you, but then we have the peace of God in our heart. So we have peace with God. But then we can also have the peace of God, and he is that prince. So let's go on here. Wonderful counselor. And then uh, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And this will be an interesting one if I have time. I'll, I'll read something uh, uh, out, out of a book called the, From the Gift of Christmas. It says, There shall come forth a rod out of Jesse, uh, and that word can be translated as shoot. Uh, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh, and then it goes on, and we won't read all of it. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And it just goes on and on and on in that chapter. But the interesting thing about that, do you know what the, the, the meaning of the name of the town that Mary and Joseph came from? What's it called? Nazareth. You know what the name of the meaning of that word is? Branch or root branch and uh, let me just let me just share something quickly with you and by the way this will become important when we look at, a, at something Matthew says uh, that the prophets would said he was going to be called a Nazarene and there really is no direct prophecy about that where that word is used but there are ones about the branch and the root and that's what that word means is branch or root so Matthew knew what he was saying when the Holy Spirit was, uh, was telling him that. Let me see if I can find, find this. Ah, yes. <clears throat> now, 60 miles north of Jerusalem by air or 90 miles on the then preferred Transjordan Road. So, when Mary goes from Nazareth to see Elizabeth, and there's a lot of things to get into uh, about that, about Mary being able to go do that. And this, this author thinks probably her parents were probably dead by then because she would have had to had their permission to go make a trip like this. Uh, but anyway, she just has a, a good theory on it about going down. But anyway, by foot, and that's what Mary would have done, it would have been an 85 
about an 80 to an 85 mile trip just to Jerusalem. And then the homes of the priests, there were two basic towns, and, so, and one was, according to some historians, were like five miles from Jerusalem, the other one was further than that, maybe 12 miles. So Mary would have done that and then to go on to the town where they lived, which was probably not Jerusalem. So she may have gone like 90 miles by foot to see her cousin, Elizabeth. But at any rate, uh, or however they were related, they just know that they were related. Some call them cousin, but whatever. Uh, anyway, the 90 miles, uh, and anyway, the, the Nazareth overlooks uh, the valley of, of Armageddon, and it talks about a lot of the great wars that had happened. And by the way, Armageddon is a, something that happens in Revelation. It's going to happen there too. But anyway, it talks about all the generals that have fought battles there. Pharaoh, Nico, Nebuchadnezzar, Richard the Lionhearted, a guy named the Magnificent, Napoleon, Lord Allenby, and General Persian are some of the names that are recognized that knew about this area where Nazareth was. But anyway, Nazareth means branch town, for it comes from the Hebrew word Nestor for branch. And the derivation of the name of the town has been advanced by a number of scholars as the most likely explanation for Matthew's statement in 2.23 that he dwelt in Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And we'll look, when we get back to it, and we looked a little bit last week, the historical reasons of why they didn't go back to Bethlehem. And this author believes that when they came back from Egypt, that they, 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 they in fact, before they ever went to Egypt, there's a theory that maybe they went to Nazareth to get a bunch of stuff, whatever they had to bring back and to live in Bethlehem. And then he was warned by an angel, don't stay here, go to Egypt because Herod was going to kill out of, out of envy and, and pride and revenge, wanted to kill all the babies. Then eventually they come back when the angel tells him again in a dream that, you know, go back and instead of going to Bethlehem, which is probably where they would have gone, because there's something about Nazareth in that hometown that would have been there when you think about the whole story of Nazareth. What would they be going back to in Nazareth? Huh? An unmarried girl getting pregnant. And everybody knows it. And so, but they are warned that the angel warns uh, Joseph don't go back there and, and or, or what he does he's going to go back there but then he's told to go back and then it says the ruler that was over Bethlehem in that area was Herod's son and by the way eventually that son is, is disposed of by Rome for bad rule but because of that they need to go back to their hometown and live in this branch town fulfilling Matthew's prophecy that out of Nazareth. So anyway, there's just a lot of, lot of good stuff about that. Okay, Rod and his roots, let's go to Isaiah 53. We may not get through this first page, but you can take it and look at it on your own. Uh, Isaiah, or yeah, Isaiah 53. By the way, anybody that knows it, what's that chapter called that knows about what that is? And it actually starts in, in 52, about what it's about. The Suffering Servant. That's what Isaiah 52 and 53 are all about, the suffering servant. And, and like I said, it actually starts in, in 52, but we'll go to 53 because this is also quoted in, in so much of the, and 1 to 11, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, well, anyway, uh, I'm not going to read it all because I don't want to take the time. But anyway, the first part of it, who has believed our report, then it goes on about this person. And then verse 4 is quoted by Matthew in chapter, I think it's Matthew chapter 9 or chapter 8, about the prophecy that's fulfilled when Jesus goes into a couple of towns, and when he leaves, there's not a sick, per sick person left, nor a person who is, is overwhelmed by darkness. Everyone in those villages, Matthew said, was delivered. And then Matthew quotes these verses as the reason. And I'll, I'll just share something interesting about it, that how, what, 
where what Matthew doesn't quote that is later quoted by Peter uh, about one of the other things that happens. But anyway, surely he has borne, starting with verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs, and that word in the Hebrew can be translated sickness. And so this is where Matthew starts when he talks about surely he bore our sorrows and carried our infirmities. Surely he bore our sicknesses and carried our sorrows, and that word can be translated pains in the Hebrew. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, the suffering servant. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And one of the things that Pastor David has, has brought out, the word iniquity, as it has started to be used in the Old Testament, means something that is bent. It's out of whack. It's not broken. It's bent. And regardless of how you try to do something right through it, it won't work. And that's back to whatever we try to do in our own human efforts to be approved by God is going to fail. It's absolutely going to fail. So he was bruised for our iniquities. Uh, Matthew doesn't quote this. He stops with verse 4. But this goes on to say, and is quoted later on in the New Testament, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by, we know this one, and by his stripes or wounds we are healed. Matthew does not quote this when he talks about in, 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 his, in chapter 8, I think it is. He doesn't quote this, and some scholars believe because the last part of this, by his stripes we are healed, though it's used for that in, in, in one of Peter's letters, is that the word that is used here in this verse means everything. Physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, and eternal is what his stripes have bought us. And so a part of that is what Matthew said before about carrying our sicknesses and our pains. So it's all covered. And so when we're together and do what it says about we anointing each other with oil and that type of stuff, we are obeying what the New Testament writers and the apostles came to understand that was practiced in the church, this paid for it all, and that is a sign or a symbol of being anointed by God through the Holy Spirit that that touch will happen and that healing will happen. So anyway, he paid the price for it. In Malachi 4, 1 through 3, he is called uh, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. Isn't that an we won't look at that, but anyway, that is, that is there. So that's just some of the things, and I know that as I'm reading through, I'm going to find a lot more of either names or descriptions in the Old Testament. That's just a hint of, of, of what is there. So now we'll go to the New Testament, to John chapter 1. And Pastor John is, has taught us on this. Because if you're going to, and that's the other thing, I'll get into a chronology of, about how the scriptures, if you're going to understand the Christmas story, how they follow. And there's, you know, there's some variance in it, but it has a specific point. Most of them start with John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, because this explains everything before he ever came. And later on in chapter 1, and, and Pastor John has talked about this often, John's description of the Christmas story is in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the whole Christmas story covered by John because he doesn't deal with the particulars just like Mark does it. And a lot of theologians believe Mark doesn't because of the audience he's writing to, which at that point was probably basically Roman or Greek or Roman, Greek or Roman. The idea of who you were from heritage was not important. It was what do you do? What are you going to accomplish? And that's why when Mark jumps into the story of Christ, it's right away, wham, here is this Jesus on the scene doing miracles, doing mighty things. Because in the culture he is writing to, that's what mattered. That was the proof of who he was. And, and to Matthew, it's a Jewish thing going back to the lineage to show the connection that is correct that this Jesus who was born by Mary in Bethlehem is the king of the Jews, the Messiah, because the lineage works all its way back to King David. And then Luke 
goes beyond that where he says, yes, the lineage is true about all this stuff if it's from the Davidic line, but it goes all the way back to Adam where this promise was given like the one we read in Genesis 3.15 through the seed of woman. Salvation is going to come. So it's all there and John just says, hey, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, then in the first four verses he describes in chapter 1, he tells us who the word is and I just read it because John has, has taught on it. In the beginning was the word, and I, rem I looked this up in Greek because I had to memorize the, the first few verses in Greek, and I don't remember them anymore unless I read them out of an interlinear Greek New Testament. But in the beginning was the word, and I won't get into what, that's the word logos. Uh, we, we, do, we get the word logic from it. And what that, what that means to the people John is writing to the reason he used that, that would have been unique, not originally to Jewish culture, but to the Jewish, Greek, Roman culture, because they had learned so much, that the word logos in their Greek philosophy is the principle that stands behind everything that exists. And that's still the other ultimate problem for an atheist or anybody else who wants to deal with the fact like that one philosopher who was a skeptic says the major problem in philosophy is that something rather than nothing exists. We see it, we know it, we walk into it, we deal with it. How did it get here and where did it come from? And of course there's that the impersonal plus time plus chance answer from the concept of, of, of uh, things developing over time. The problem is where did the first particle come from? And that first particle, what makes it hold together? Because that's what scientists have discovered. Everything that exists is energy in motion. Everything is nothing but energy in motion. And so what makes that, and you know, that makes that subatomic particle hang together so that, that, what that, and I forget which one it is, but you have, you have a nucleus and then one thing surrounding that nucleus, why does it stay there? And, the, and John says, well, it's this, and in Colossians, Paul says, I know who it is, it's Jesus. And in chapter one, he says, he is the power that makes all things consist and that word means hold together. And Louis Giglio says, if you got something going on in your life that seems like everything is out of control, you know who you need to look to? Is Jesus. Because he is the power that makes everything hold together. Basically, yes. And, and uh, what we call light... Uh, they have to use a uh, those subatomic or those super accelerator microscopic things they are just to be able to see that because you, it's not like like the sun you can't see it with the naked eye you can't see it without a special instrument that lets you see that atom that exists and see that particle going around it so why does it stay there because Jesus is responsible for it that's what it says. So anyway, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And in the Greek, it's God was the Word. Uh, that is there. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 4 said, In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that goes back to those two basic things of light and life. That's Jesus. Uh, and I brought that in in John 1, 4, 7, and 9. It talks about light and life. John 14, we looked at that. John 1, 14 is the Christmas story. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then let's go to uh, Matthew 24, 7, and then we'll look quickly, and we'll jump quickly to Luke, and then we'll be about done with that outline, and then we'll just share some things uh, t t together. Um, Matthew 24, 7, and the pages on my Bible. It's those real thin pages, and they don't cooperate very well. They last a long time. But uh, 
Oh, by the way, let me back up and make so you can make a correction. In Malachi 4, 1 through 3, I have son, S-O-N. The word is S-U-N in the Bible. He is the son of righteousness, meaning, and later on, we don't have it on this page, but we'll see other names of Jesus. One is called Dayspring. One is called the Morning Star. Uh, but that's it. So change that. Make a note of it. It's not S-O-N. It's S-U-N because he is the sun, the bright, shining light of righteousness. And so that, and I, I made a note on mine, but I didn't on any of those that I copied that that's S-U-N on that. So anyway, Matthew 24, 7. I'm about to find it. I must have written it down wrong. I'll have to look that up. Go to Matthew. Uh, yeah, I did. I, I wrote that down wrong. I'll have to get the correction on that for you next week. Go to Luke chapter 1. You're really close to it. I didn't catch that when I proofread it. Chapter 1, verse 35. See if I got that one right. I didn't own that one either, did I? Anyway, I'll look those up and correct them for you. You can do it on or if you want to, because if you got a if you got a thing, you can you can find it. Uh, let me look. Let me look one second here. Okay, I just wrote I wrote it down wrong, didn't I? It's all right. Change that. Thank you. It's it's. No, oh, wait a minute. It is it is Luke one thirty five. Excuse me. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And this is Gabriel talking to Mary. Therefore, the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. I did have it right. On 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 Luke. I've got to I've got to look at at um, Matthew sometime and get that one corrected. So it is is the Son of God. Anyway. Uh, notice, notice on there, he's called both the Son of God, the Son of Man. Son of Man is used 70 times of Jesus in Scripture. Son of God is used, I didn't count the times, but it's used uh, uh, quite a few times. Uh, and in, at any rate, uh, Mary is, and, and by the way, let me just, let me talk about Zach and Zacharias and Mary for a minute. If you remember the story, we won't get into it because that's a whole other thing when you look at the personalities, but if you go back, and, and look at uh, the angel coming to Zacharias, the priest. And anyway, he tells him that, you know, your wife Elizabeth, who's been bearing, she's going to have a baby and all that kind of stuff. And verse 18 of, of Luke chapter 1, it says, And Zacharias said, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And I like what, what this one author said about it, because Mary is going to say when the angel tells her, you're going to become pregnant, and it's going to be by God, or, or it, 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 you know, it says you're going to be pregnant, and Mary says, how can this be? I know not a man. Understand there's a difference between the two responses. Zach, and, and by the way, uh, Zach, the angel starts by telling Zacharias, your prayer has been heard. It's been, you've been praying for a long time. They're old people, geezers like me. She's a geezeress. Okay. So, you know, we don't have kids at that age. And I like what the one author said about what the angel said to her, what Zacharias is saying, you're too late. It's a good announcement, but you're too late. The one, one thing about going on and realizing that his little brief battle with unbelief, because he is right, they, they do what they're so it says earlier that they were just and righteous before God, doing all the things by faith, that God wants them to do. That's why their prayer has been heard. And Angel Gabriel doesn't say, well, that, that blew it. You, you made a negative confession. No, it's still going to happen. It's just that I'm going to make it so you can't talk for a while. <laughs> you're going to know that I'm speaking from God because I'm going to make it so you're going to be mute for a while. But it is still going to take place. And it's like the, the person... Who, who their Jesus is going to minister to about their child. 
And Jesus talks about having faith. Do you believe? And he says, yes, I believe. And then he makes the confession, help my unbelief because my flesh always gets in the way. And that's what happened to Zacharias. But notice that God still had him and Elizabeth picked out of the crowd and it's still going to happen. But anyway, to Zach, he said, Zach and Zacharias is saying, you're too late. What Mary is saying, I'm a virgin. You truly, really, I, I don't have a husband. And that's when the angel Gabriel makes this explanation. You don't need a husband for this. In fact, that's why you've been chosen, because you are not married. And this person who's going to be born in you by God through the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be uniquely the Son of God because it's not going to come through Adam's line. Adam's line is listed. By the way, Mary is also of the Davidic line. And that's very important to remember. It's just the male side of that, that one cell embryo that's going to be formed is going to come by the Holy Spirit, so it's sinless. And that three billion bit DNA code that normally matches half and half takes half for Mary, but the other half comes from God. So that there's no sin in this person. And it's like it's going to say later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he who knew no sin became sin for us. And that's that whole, I won't get into it, that whole, to me, the ultimate miracle in all of eternity, past, present, and future, is that time when the Father placed every sin of every human being, past, present, or future, who will ever will, on Jesus' shoulders. And that's what stomped Satan's head because the price was paid. Satan didn't realize it until the regular resur resurrection came, but the price had been paid. And that's why looking back on it, Paul says it to the Corinthian people, if Satan had to do over again, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory because it brought them defeat. For all eternity, they've already lost now, salvation for each one of us is past, present, and future. We've been forgiven of and delivered from the penalty of sin. We are being delivered by the, from the power of sin and living more and more the way God wants us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We will be delivered from the presence of sin and live forever with a new body a new body and so that's all that's all contained in that one other thing and then, then we'll shut it down son of god and son of man jesus is the only 200 percenter who ever was or will ever be 100 percent god 100 percent men man so that he could pay the eternal price for our sin and when we get into page two and three you get into other titles and of course you get into the revelation king of kings lord of lords the lamb slain before the foundation of the world that somehow in god's mind and i'll never forget my history or my uh greek or one of my professors and he, he taught philosophy as well as he taught uh, pneumatology the holy spirit that Dr. Hammond's statement was, we never really wrap our minds about around the, the t concept of the Trinity. But he said, when you get it in practical terms, the Father thought it, the Son bought it, the Spirit brought it. And that's an oversimplification, but it's how they all work together to bring this person to earth, the Word made flesh to dwell among us. And that's why Hayford says, hey, don't give up on celebrating Christmas. Ring the bells, dance, jump, shout, sing the carols, and all of that kind of stuff, because that's really what it's about, is celebrating him. And that's why he says in that book, if you're going to do it, before you, put up the, before you put up the decorations, pray and dedicate it to Jesus. This is about glorifying you, Jesus. Or if you don't do it, Dedicate not doing it to Jesus because I just want it to be uh, about you. Okay, uh, I was going to see, and I don't think I'll take the time. We'll do it next week about 
I'll just I'll give you some of the some of, some of the titles that he goes through. Dr. Hayford does in this, and we'll look at it next week about who he is. He is the Redeemer. He is the Revealer. He is the Creator. He is the Sustainer. All things consist. He is the Leader. He is the Fountain. He is the Reconciler. And He's going to come back. King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So that's this Jesus when we're celebrating Christmas. So uh, any other questions or comments and we'll we'll shut down and take prayer real quick. I don't know if any of you remember that Chris, who used to pastor here, had a, had a an Well, I know that in Louis Giglio's thing, you have a particle in your body called, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, laminin. Laminin. And the subatomic, or the, the micro, excuse me, the, the, they have to use a special microscope. I can't think of the right term for it, but it, it, it's the only way that you can look at subatomic particles. The lamican, lamican, laminin molecule in your body is in the shape of a cross. <coughs> Literally looks like a cross. And that's what Louis Giglio, in, in that, when he's talking about that, he refers to Colossians, the first chapter and says that's the one that can hold your life together if you'll trust him as Savior and Lord because that's what he's doing to the entire universe. And you've got millions and billions of little microscopic cells, protein in your body, holding it together. And that's why when he talks about the other end, end of the, 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 the uh, darling of astronomy, the the galaxy that sits perpendicular to us, not the Milky Way, and now that name's gone from me too. Uh, but when you look at it at the center in the black hole, when they took images of that black hole in the center of that galaxy, it's in the shape of a cross. And that's what Louis Giglio does. This is what John was saying. Wherever you go, you cannot get away from the cross. It is the only answer. So yeah, it, it's about the cross. Anything else? We'll take requests. And what? I don't know. I'll look. You can. You. You can. You can. You can. And and it, it may have been, but anyway, it, it's used. I'll I'll find it and correct it. But you can look in your own concordance and index and find it. It'll it'll be there. Uh, I I had proofread it, but I just didn't catch that. So yeah, son of God, son of man, and they both hold just the tremendous implications for what Jesus has done for us and why it was a requirement for him to be both for us to have a savior yeah okay